Partnerships in clinical trials, it's a way for me to learn what the latest trends are. I'm John Lamatina. I'm the former president of Pfizer Global R&D, where I was at Pfizer for 30 years. And since that time, I've done a variety of things, but I'm a senior partner at Pure Tech Ventures in, in Boston. I'm often asked about mergers and acquisitions, uh, in the big, particularly in the big pharma side, because I've had a, a fair degree of experience uh, in that area. Uh, Pfizer, as, as many people know, uh, first did a hostile takeover, actually, of Warner Lambert Park Davis in 2000, and then merged with uh, Pharmacia in 2004, I believe. And then after I le shortly after I left, did another major acquisition of, of Wyeth, and so I've gotten to see an awful lot of, of uh, acquisitions and activities surrounding acquisitions and what's involved in, in, in various mergers and acquisitions. Now, I have to say that the leaders of these companies uh, enter into acquisitions fully uh, with eyes open. They know exactly what they're looking for. And, and in a lot of ways, they make tremendous business sense. You can get great synergies. Uh, you have uh, presumably complementary uh, product lines that you can blend and use your resources to maybe drive sales a little bit more. Uh, you have great synergies. Uh, synergies is sort of a euphemism for cuts. Uh, using uh, uh, one uh, IT organization, using the same sort of uh, sales forces, maybe bolstered up a little bit. But uh, you can save an awful lot of money with fewer factories, fewer production facilities, et cetera. And so, uh, in general, when the CEOs announce mergers, they'll talk about savings in the billions of dollars. I mean, it makes great business sense. The trouble I have found with those, and I've written a little bit about this on my, uh, uh, both in the literature and my Forbes blog, is that the engine of an organization uh, is the R&D part of the organization. And Mergers and acquisitions can be very difficult because you're not just fusing two groups. You're really looking for similar kind of savings when you merge two organizations. And, and not only will you have two pipelines that you'll have to blend, you'll have two pipelines, but in all likelihood, there's going to be some overlap. Most people are working in similar therapeutic areas. And if you had two organizations both having uh, portfolios in, in, say, cancer research, chances are two-thirds of the projects might be similar. And so there is some great benefit to being able to understand why people made certain choices and why they picked certain applications and approaches and, and why uh, another company might have picked others. But then you have the inevitability pull and tug of, well, which program are we going to continue on? We can't do all of these. We're not going to be big enough to do that. Which do we cut? And those can be pretty devastating discussions to have. Scientists do science because they believe in what they've been working on. If you spend two or three years on a project and then suddenly there's been a merger and some uh, leader comes in from another company that you've never met before and says, well, this is sort of nice, but we're not going to do this one. We're going to go on with this other project. It's pretty hard to take. Now, the other thing that also comes up is that you're not going to want to have research spread all around the world. So. Uh, you, you can have, you can try, and we did try this for a while at Pfizer uh, with our first merge with Warner Lambert, having, say, your cancer group located in three different parts of the world. Uh, in our case, it was uh, uh, Groton, Connecticut, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and La Jolla, California. But it's pretty difficult if you think about trying to have group meetings by video conferences in, in different, such different time zones. And, and it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. So. Inevitably, you'll try and consolidate these groups, and so you're forcing people either to move to a new location or to, or to leave. So while mer major mergers and acquisitions make great business sense in a lot of ways, they do take a, a dramatic toll on an R&D organization. And I think in the long term, most people have seen that that really doesn't work out too well. Now, there are, I'm often asked about predicting the future on, on these sort of mergers. And for one thing, I don't know if there are going to be a lot more major acquisitions, as, as, as I just discussed, simply because there aren't that many major companies anymore. A lot of them have, have unfortunately been merged into others. If you look at, the, at now what makes up Pfizer, the number of companies uh, that have been brought into the fold must number in about 10 or 12. Uh, and so there are fewer and fewer of, of, of major companies around. However, I think you'll see some trends of smaller companies merging, particularly 
uh, startup companies that have been successful enough to get a product, maybe two to the market, but will suffer from uh, sort of pipeline exhaustion, spending so much time and effort in, in bringing these compounds to market that uh, the earlier discovery uh, uh, pipeline might have suffered a little bit. So you could see mergers of, of, uh, big com of two smaller companies together to try and complement each other and, and, and form a, a company with a little bit greater mass. So some of that might happen. I think you'll also, though, see continued acquisitions of big companies of smaller startup companies, companies that uh, uh, have a product and, and some assets that a larger company has. I was part of one of those. In fact, I was on the board of Human Genome Sciences and uh, uh, Glaxo uh, Smith Klein came out and bought. They had already had a number of collaborations with Human Genome Sciences and it made sense to buy the company. And so I think I think you'll uh, see more uh, of those type of deals going forward. One of the advantages of, of being now somebody who's been part of, of the biopharmaceutical industry in effect for 37 years is, is you've seen a lot over this period of time. And, and I have to chuckle when I hear people say, you know, uh, Big Pharma is, is getting out of discovery aspects of, of uh, R&D and, and creating maybe a very small R but a very big D. And, and I chuckle at this because uh, people don't realize that, at least ever since I've been part of this industry, Big Pharma has always had about a third of their products sourced on the outside. In the 1970s and 80s, these compounds didn't come from biotech or academia. They came from small companies that existed in those days, be it in Europe or Germany or even in the United States, and companies who had a compound that looked interesting but didn't have the wherewithal to develop it and or uh, sell and market it uh, around the globe. And they would turn to big companies to do that. Uh, one of the great examples I like to use is that of one of my competitors from my early days, Merck. Merck uh, was one of the most admired companies in the industry. For seven years, in fact, of all uh, major companies in the industry, not just pharma, but all companies, Merck was the most admired company in the world. And it was for a number of reasons, not the least of which was a very strong R&D organization. And yet people don't realize that a, a large number of the products that Merck was selling and helped drive their business to be one, at the top of, of the industry were compounds they licensed from the outside, be it uh, a compound for osteoporosis, Fosamax, or the proton pump inhibitor, uh, omeprazole, or the H2 antagonist, uh, famotidine, uh, or even the uh, cardiovascular uh, blood pressure lowering drug, uh, Losartan. All of these really came from outside deals. Now, Merck brought tremendous science to each of these deals. In fact, uh, in a couple of cases, they were able uh, to save the compounds because there was some animal toxicology found in the development program that Merck went in and explained why this, was, this toxicology was unique to a certain animal species and proved that it would be safe in humans, and they turned out to be major products. So uh, forever, co companies have been outsourcing, uh, outsourcing, looking for products on the outside, in effect, outsourcing the R part of their organization because you can't be doing everything, no matter how big your R&D organization is. And I certainly was part of one of the biggest ones uh, during my time at Pfizer. You'd be arrogant to say you, you can corner the market and all the good ideas, and you'd be arrogant to think that your R&D people are so good that uh, you'd be able to be successful in every area. And so. Uh, as a way to uh, fortify your pipeline, as a way to expand it in some areas that you might not be doing research in, and, and suddenly you want to you have a, a product line in that area, it makes tremendous sense to be outsourcing. What's changed from my early days is the tremendous growth of the biotechnology industry and the number of academic institutions that are really doing basic drug discovery research, which was non-existent, I'd say, even 15 uh, years ago, and I was stunned when I saw that now there are at least 100 uh, universities at least having some component of, of drug discovery work going on uh, in these institutions. So the model has changed, and, and big pharma companies now are looking toward uh, these sources uh, of, of compounds in order to, again, uh, uh, bring in anywhere from a third to even more of, of their product line. I, I've seen some people now saying, well, maybe we should source half of our of our uh, future products from the outside and, uh, and consolidate things a little more internally. That might happen. Uh, but I think you have to have a component of your own original research because uh, 
uh, first of all, uh, a lot of major drugs are still discovered in, in, in big pharma companies and the larger companies, uh, but also having the internal expertise to be able to look at things and to, and to understand what might succeed or fail and, and, uh, and, and really to bring a, a strong eye to what's going on, I think is important as well. So uh, I, I think that it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a valuable way to become a stronger company by sourcing materials from the outside and compounds from the outside. And I think that will, will continue. I think there's one other trend that's also of interest, and that's uh, pre-competitive uh, uh, collaborations. And that was something that even a dozen years ago, again, was foreign to big pharma thinking. Uh, and by uh, pre-competitive uh, uh, collaborations, I'm talking about doing things where uh, you can pool the resources of a lot of companies uh, to work in a variety of different areas, particularly on the technology side. So, uh, you know, there are a, a, a lot of needs that companies have uh, delivering uh, peptide drugs. Uh, uh, is, is always been a, a holy grail. Uh, uh, great uh, uh, new technologies to uh, increase the, the the capability to do screening, or new technologies in terms of imaging or or of biomarkers. All things that could help you progress your either discovery program or development program further on down the line. But for one company to try and make investments in all those things is, is pretty difficult. And one of the things that we've done at PureTech was to start a company called Enlight, which is made up of uh, a consortium of uh, eight to nine uh, major companies. And uh, each company puts in uh, some, about a couple million dollars, and, and they ask to, to, to seek out research in some of the areas I've just described, in fact. And, it's, uh, and they all share in the outcomes of these research. So a breakthrough made in any of these, uh, each company would capitalize on it. So it's a way of taking some money, not an extraordinary amount, pooling it in such a way that you can effectively do things uh, across a variety of areas that, if successful, can be a major breakthrough in the R&D process. So that's something that never would have been done, as I said, some years ago. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that now. Partnerships in clinical trials is, is a very interesting conference. And I have to say that in my time at, at Pfizer, it wasn't something I uh, was invited to attend or to speak at. However, uh, I've been coming uh, pretty routinely now for the past few years. And uh, it's a way for me to learn what the latest trends are and what some of the issues are going forward in, in a pretty important and probably the most expensive part of the R&D process, that being clinical trials. Uh, one example this morning, I was uh, attended a, a session talking about the role of patients in clinical trials, and two of the people on the panel discussions were actually people uh, who were patients and who have been part of clinical trials going forward. And hearing their perspective and hearing uh, what they they think are some minor changes that that big companies can do to help uh, patients uh, not only uh, be willing to participate in clinical trials, but be, be able to be better patients in clinical trials, which is eye-opening along the way. And this conference is full of examples like that. So it's, it's uh, fun to come uh, to sort of uh, get out of my uh, uh, little uh, office and, and to come here and to, and to get exposed to some of the latest thinking that's happening in, as I said, the area where probably 85% of all R&D dollars are going to today.